Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses 31 through 39 this morning as we wrap up our series on, on Romans 8 uh, that, that Rio began several weeks ago. Uh, over the past several weeks, we have walked through this chapter in Scripture. We've seen how the Lord works uh, in salvation and how the Lord has worked in our lives. And this morning, as we get to the last nine verses here, uh, we are reaching the finale. We are reaching the climax of this passage. So let's go ahead and read it. Let's see what it says. Starting in verse 31, Paul writes, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Before we dive deep into the rest of the passage, we have to start at the first verse. Verse 31, as I just read, says, What then shall, shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This verse is going to act as a summary point or a main point for the rest of, the, of, of this passage. If God is for us, who can be against us? In the rest of this passage, Paul is going to show how we can know that God is for us. And people disagree about what this verse is referencing. When it says, what then shall we say to these things? Is he referencing the verses earlier at the end of chapter 8? Or is he referencing all the way back to chapter 5, as some people think? Or is he referencing all the way back to chapter 1? Basically, is Paul referencing his whole letter? He's saying, now that we know what God has done for us in salvation, what do we say? Basically, what Paul is saying is God is for us. Paul's not, Paul's not asking uh, who's going to oppose us. Paul is posing a question here saying, God is for us, no one can be against us. Paul knows that Christians are going to face opposition, some more than others. But what Paul is saying is there will be no ultimate victory against the people of God. It's not a question without a knowable answer. God is for us, and every effort against us will fail. Now, I've used illustrations up here before. Uh, you guys know my, I, I played baseball growing up. Um, I was terrible, really bad. Um, it, it's okay. I, I, I accept that. Uh, but when I was in that 9, 10, 11, 12, th those leagues there, there was another guy who was about my age named Jordan Thornburg. Jordan Thornburg, he just sounds like a menacing person. Uh, but Jordan grew faster than all the other boys. So Jordan is a big dude uh, as a 9-year-old. And by the time he's 11, he's throwing probably 70 miles an hour. No one can hit him. Everyone, every team looks and goes, oh, man, we're playing Jordan's team. He's going to strike everybody out. He throws harder than anybody else we have. We just have to wait until Jordan gets tired. They bring in somebody else. Then we can actually hit. Right? Every time we would look at the schedule for those 9, 10, 11, 12, those four years in those leagues, we're like, oh, we have to play Jordan Thornburg's team. Because for his team, if Jordan is for us, who can be against us? I was on the opposite side of that. Basically, jo I was never on his team. But if he was on the opposite team, I was like, I, I've, there's nothing I can do. There, there is nothing that, that we're going to be able to do against Jordan. Jordan Thornburg can kind of point us to what the Bible says about God. And now for his team, they had confidence. Anytime Jordan steps up on the mound, they're thinking, if Jordan is for us, who can be against us? All we've got to do is score a couple runs. No one's going to be able to hit him. And it's easy for us to look at this verse and go, if God is for us, who can be against us? Man, that's inspiring. 
man, that's, that's going to pump me up. Uh, I, I'm really going to hold on to that. I can memorize it. I can read it. But does it affect the way we live? Does it affect how we live? Does it affect how we worship? Does it affect how we pray? Does it affect how we share our faith? Does it affect how we read the Bible? Do we live knowing that God is for us and that ultimately all other efforts against us will fail? And that's what we're going to look at today. Everything that we look at for the next few minutes is going to show us how we can know that God is for us. And hopefully, by the end, I want to give you guys a picture of this God, of this God who is for us, this God who is powerful, so that we can live in the reality that God is for us and no one can come against us. First, we're going to start with looking to the one who has given us everything. We look to the one who gives us everything. In verse 32, he writes, Paul writes, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Look to the one who gives us everything. Verse 32 shows us a God who graciously gives gifts to his people. We know from other passages in the Bible that God is a loving father, that God loves to give gifts. But this verse is rooted in the fact that God gave up his son for us. And the language here references back to the language in Genesis 22. Or if you know what happens in Genesis 22, it's where God calls Abraham to give up his son, his only son, in a sacrifice. It also points back to Isaiah 53, as, uh, as Paul shows that it was God's will and God's plan to sacrifice Jesus, to give Jesus for the sake of his people. So we can see from this first verse, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? We can see that God has given us, or is giving us all gifts based on the fact that God has given us the greatest gift. He sent his son for us. The whole Old Testament points to the fact that there's a Messiah coming. And not just that there's a Messiah coming, but that God is going to give this Messiah over so that we can be saved. He's going to sacrifice this Messiah. He's going to sacrifice his son so that we can have salvation. But notice another word here in verse 32. He, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Now, I, I do this in youth. I'm pretty sure I've done this up here too. Um, I, I'm not going to ask you to actually do this, but usually I ask, raise your hand if you were an Israelite. And none of the youth raised their hands. And then I ask, raise your hand if you were a Gentile. And all of the youth raised their hands. It would be the same in here, unless you are uh, ethnically Jewish. Um, when it says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, you can look around. Those are the people we're sitting by. Those are the people we worship with on Sunday. In the Old Testament, the Israelites are God's people. After Christ has died, risen again, uh, defeated the power of death, he died for everybody. He brought the nations before the throne. So if I had said, who, who did Christ die for? Who did God give his son for? It's Americans. It's Ethiopians. It's the Chinese. It's Koreans. It's Europeans. It's not just the Israelites. It's you and me. It's people who were not part of the people of God in the Old Testament, but who have been brought in by the gracious love of the Father. This is a God who draws in the nations. This is a God who says, I want the message of what my son has done to reach every tongue and every tribe and every nation around the world. So when he says, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He gave up his son. He gave up his son for the nations. But it shows. If God has given us the greatest gift, he's going to continue to give us the gifts that we need. He's going to continue to give good gifts because that's what a father does. And I know that, that everyone's relationship with their father might be different. And some may not have a father in their lives. I left it over here, so I'm going to have to walk over. Um, but I want you to think about a parent uh, that you have or maybe a parent figure uh, that you have, and ha who has given you a gift. And see, the last time we were at my parents' house, um, they live in, in North Carolina now, 
Uh, my dad was in the military, many of you know. Uh, and after he retired, they moved out to North Carolina. Uh, and, and when we were there, he had given my brother and I one of these gifts. You know, we each got the same one. Uh, oh, one of them fell. Uh, but what this is is a shadow box of his time in the Navy. My dad was in the Navy for 28 years. Um, so he's got medals that signify his rank. He's got medals that signify his duty stations and ribbons uh, that show where he served. Uh, my brother and I each have one of these. Now, we like to, to mess with each other, like, oh, I've got more stars on this one than you do, or I've got more. Uh, but they're the same. Uh, this was a gift to us. It's up in my office. Uh, I, I keep it up there with some of the rest of the things uh, that I have on the shelves there. Uh, but that is a gift from my father. Now, it's not a car that I drive every day. It's not food that nourishes me. It's not something that I'm like, oh, I absolutely needed that to survive. But what it is, it's a good gift from a loving father who showed, I want to give something to my child to show that I love him. Not only did the 28 years of service to our family, to the country, uh, to his job, not only did that bring gifts, but this is a gift that shows his love for us, for me. God gives gifts that shows his love for us. God gives the church. God gives families. God gives his word. Ultimately, God gave his son. So the fact that God will graciously give us all things should be evidence of the fact that he is for us. Not in a cheer us on from the sidelines, like a, yeah, you guys can do it but in the way of giving his only son, in a way of sacrificing himself, laying his son's life down on the line. Now, God gives good gifts and will graciously give us all things, but he has also declared us righteous. So we must look to the one who justifies, not condemns. Look at verse 33. Paul writes, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Verse 34, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Looking at verses 33 and 34, you see that God does not condemn, but instead he justifies. And Paul asks two questions in this section. He asks, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? And then later, who is to condemn? Again, these are, these are rhetorical questions. Call, Paul's not actually asking like, hey, anybody out there going to bring a charge? Anybody out there going to condemn? Uh, What he is saying is no one can. What he is saying is who can bring a charge against God's elect? No one. What he is saying in 34, who is to condemn? No one. Because as Rio preached several weeks ago, Romans 8, chapter 1, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If God is for us, who can be against us? There is no condemnation. This point of justification is really a repetition of Paul's letter to the Romans of showing how we are sinful, but God sent his son to die for us so that we can be declared righteous, so that we can have life. Paul repeats it over and over and over again. It is a declaration that we who are sinners and we who deserve condemnation have been given the righteousness of Christ. It is the work of God that we should be forever grateful for. See, in these verses, Paul is writing uh, that that Jesus is the one who died. He took the penalty that we should have taken. He stands in for us. But notice something in in verse uh, verse 33, right? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Yours may say will bring, uh, but either way, it's future. And in the original text, it's one word. So it's, it's, it's one word that shows this is a future tense. Not only does it mean in in this time who's going to bring in our lifetime for the next however many years we have left on this earth, who's going to bring any condemnation against us, but it also means at the end of time, the final judgment, when we stand before God, who is there to bring condemnation? Because Jesus is going to stand in and say, he's mine and she's mine. All right, ladies, think of it like your wedding day. Let's pretend you're, you're, you're getting ready for your wedding. You're in the room, you're, you're getting all dressed, you, you put your white dress on, you get your makeup done just the way you want it. You get your hair uh, all done up just, just perfectly, 
you, you open the door, and you have a mile walk to the altar. It's down a dirt path. It has just rained. It's a crisp fall day. You're going to walk down the path. You've got to get there. Your, your fiancé has committed his life to you. He has said with the ring that you've been given, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with you. I have chosen you. You're excited. Let's go get married. All right. Start walking. Now immediately, you start down the dirt path. There's the, the train of the dress behind you. It's going to get dirty. Right? So you, you start walking. You're going as carefully as you can. But you realize we're on a time crunch, right? So they start, you start walking, you start accumulating leaves and dirt and mud. And then you, you slip because you got your nice wedding shoes on. They're not meant to walk down dirt paths. Uh, you, you slip, you fall, you've got dirt on you and mud on you. And then at one point, you, you, you're passing down the path and you see a big pile of leaves somebody has raked up. You're like, man, I could use... I, I could use a break from this walking down the path. I'm going to go jump into the leaves. You jump into the leaves. It's so fun. You get up and you realize, oh, man, I have made a mistake. But you've got to keep going. You're running out of time. You're walking down the path, walking down the path. You get to basically where the, the chairs end. It's an outdoor wedding. You see the groom standing at the end. The music starts to play. And you look down and you realize your white dress is no longer white. It's dirty, it's muddy, it might be ripped in some places. You've got leaves on you. You feel your hair, it's not up the way you want it anymore. You realize, I've ruined this. Shame and guilt comes through you. And you feel, I, I can't go through with this. I, I can't do this. But the music starts to play, it's no longer special. It's, it's shameful. You walk up the aisle. You get to the end, and, and the, you're holding, you, you get to, to hold the groom's hands. And the groom, you look at the groom, and you say, I'm sorry. I've, I've ruined it. And the groom looks back at you and says, it's okay. I bought you a new dress. You are still mine. And you will always be mine. That's what it's like. As we uh, go through this life, we have been transformed, we have been changed, we have been justified. We saw evidence of that in the baptism this morning. But I can guarantee you that just because I have baptized Isaiah does not mean that Isaiah has stopped sinning. Does not mean that anybody who's been baptized and who has made a profession of faith and who has said, I surrender my life to Jesus, has stopped sinning. And as we go through this life, it can be tempting to say, well, I know that I made this profession of faith, but, and I'm trying to live the way that Christ wants me to live, but I fail constantly. It's easy to say, he's not going to want me at the end. But it says that Jesus has justified us. He's going to stand in our place. He's going to give us his righteousness and say, oh yeah, Connor, he's mine. Adam, he's mine. Regina, she's mine. Justification shows that God is for us. Because if God is for us, who can stand against us? You want to believe that God is for us? Look what he did through the sacrifice of his son. Look at how he has justified us and declared us as righteous. And third, look to the one who preserves us. Starting in verse 35, Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he repeats this phrase, sort of, at the end of 39. Uh, he goes all through this, 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 this. will be able to separate us from the love of Christ in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he bookends uh, this passage saying, Who can separate us? And then he goes through all the lists and he says, Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now, let's look at what Paul says. Paul says in 35, Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? This is not an arbitrary list of just bad things that happen to people. This is not just a list of ailments that general people have. If you, if you want to, you can flip over to 2 Corinthians 11. I'm going to read 23 to 30. 
Paul writes, Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. So this list back in Romans 8 that Paul says, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword, it's not just an arbitrary list of things. This is Paul's experience. This is what Paul has gone through. Paul has taken the beatings. Paul has taken the stonings. Paul has been naked and cold and hungry and thirsty for the service of the Lord. Paul is not saying, well, any th- theoretically, any of you that have a suffering, that's not going to separate you. Paul knows in his bones. Paul knows in his scars. Paul knows in the, the, the traumatic stress on his body that none of that stuff is going to separate him from the love of Christ. Paul knows that none of the hardships that he has faced, none of the hardships that we will face, none of the hardships that anybody who is in Christ will ever face is going to separate him from the love of Christ. Paul says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And 38, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You guys see why this is the climax of this passage. You guys see why this is the finale of Romans chapter 8. Paul is saying, no matter what happens in our lives, nothing is going to separate us from the love of Christ. And this passage, 31 to 39, shows it's not anything that we have done. Because if it's up to me, uh, I would have separated myself. I would have prone to wander, right, as the hymn says. Uh, But it's not up to me. The whole passage has shown if God is for us, who can be against us? God is the one who gives gifts. God is the one who justifies. God is the one who preserves us. So as we, uh, as, we, as we think about what it means to live in the reality that if God is for us, who can be against us? We have to remember these points. We have to look to the one who gives good gifts, including his son. We have to look to the one who justifies us now and in the future. We have to look to the one who preserves us. No matter how rough life gets, no matter the trials that we face, we know that God is holding on to us and that God is preserving us. Going back to my uh, illustration earlier about Jordan Thornburg, uh, actually God is not like Jordan Thornburg uh, because, and to toot my own horn a little bit, one game I got a hit off of Jordan Thornburg. And now, okay, it wasn't, it wasn't an actual like swinging hit. I bunted. Okay, so if you, uh, if you know anything about baseball, um, a bunt, you just stick the bat out there and wait for the ball to hit it. Um, so I did that. I beat it out, got, got on base safely. Um, but it shows that Jordan is a finite baseball player. I don't think he played in high school. Uh, he grew faster than everybody else, but then everybody else kind of passed Jordan. He is not pitching in the major leagues right now. Um, I'm not sure what he's doing. Um, but God is not like Jordan. Because while Jordan had a weakness and eventually faded into the pack, God doesn't. God has no weakness. And that statement, if God is for us, then who can be against us? That will always be true. 
because nothing can come against this God. God has shown his power. God has shown his might. God has shown his ability to save. God has shown his ability to justify. God has shown his ability to give. And this is all what I want you to be excited about this morning. What I want you to see this morning. See this God. See the reason we come to worship on Sunday morning. See the reason we study his word. See the reason we pray and believe it. I want you to see this God. I want you to see what he has done for us. And the fact that he is for us. For those who are believers, we serve and worship a God who is for us, who has done all of this. So for those who are believers, what I would tell you is do this and live, right, as the Bible says. Continue to to read the word, continue to to spend time in prayer, continue to worship as you believe uh, that, that this is the God that we serve. Have a picture of who this God is. For those who are unbelievers, this is what I want you to long for. This is what I'm praying for you to long for. To long for a God who forgives your sins, a God who justifies you, a God who sent his son for you, a God who loves you. Now hear me when I say this. If you're an unbeliever in here, this verse, if God is for us, who can be against us? It doesn't apply to you. Now God loves you, but he desire, but you are still separated from him because of your sin. And this morning, there's, there will be an opportunity for you to surrender your life, to say, I have sinned, I have fallen short, and I surrender my life to Jesus. As we wrap up this morning, we're going to pray, we're going to take communion, we're going to sing a final song. But let's do that in light of the fact that we have a God who is for us, in remembrance and understanding of the fact that we have a God who is for us. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for the opportunity to come uh, this morning to worship you, to sing your praises, to study your word. God, I pray that you would remind us, not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesdays, but you would remind us to look to you, to see the gifts you have given us, to see uh, the, the fact that you have justified us, to see how you preserve us despite life circumstances. God, I pray that you would remind us of that. I pray that as we enter into a time of communion, as we enter into a time of worship, uh, that you would be glorified. We thank you for what you were doing in this church. We pray that you would continue uh, to work and move. In Jesus' name, amen.